with him? I sure hope so. About a hundred, and I believe eighty, some say eighty-five, some say a hundred and eighty-six years ago, on this day, March the 6th, about between four to six o'clock in the morning, Mexican army was gathered around a place called the Alamo. They attacked on all four sides of the Alamo. But before they did that, the general of Mexico, Antonio de La Paz de Santa Ana, he played a song called the Deguelo. The Deguelo was a song which let them know that the war was, that the battle was fixing to be done and there would be no survivors, that no one would survive. When they'd all been killed within this hour and a half, two hour battle, a big hole was dug outside the Alamo and their bodies were placed in there. And I don't think they were placed, they probably were just thrown in. And they were set afire. And they were all burned up. The Deguello was something that meant no survivors, no one was, would be alive, no one would make it. I want you to think about your life right now and how you're living your life, and I want to ask you, is the Deguelo played in your life or when you close your eyes finally? Will there be no help for you? Will there not be a place called heaven for you to go to? Are you writing your epitaph of the Deguelo in your life as you live your life. I'm breaking this up because we're going to continue our study in the rich man of Lazarus this morning. And as we look at this, I want to show you a picture that I got off the internet that has to do with kind of where we're dealing with this morning. This morning. <coughs> you can see the body dies, and when it dies, we had a spirit that went to paradise or a spirit that went to a place called Tartarus or Tartarus. Now I would say that probably about 90% of the preachers in our brotherhood, they buy in to this model up here. Now what happens is that we stay in paradise, we stay in Tartarus until the resurrection. And then at the resurrection, there is the judgment. And then we either go to a place called hell or a place called heaven. Now, the place called hell, the Bible tells us that hell will be cast into a lake of fire. So that circle down there should probably say lake of fire, maybe not so much hell. Now, I'm fine with what it is up there, but I do not buy in that we still go to paradise. I believe that we go to a place called heaven. And if we're going to say that we go to paradise, then let's quit singing the song that tells us that when we die, that we're with the Lord in heaven. Because apparently we're not with the Lord in heaven. We're with the Lord in a place called paradise. Well, if the Lord and God is in paradise, then Jesus is in paradise, and he sits at the right hand of his Father in paradise. So we're not even going to heaven when we die then, <coughs> according to that, if we buy in to that scenario. Now, it doesn't matter to me which one of these you want to buy into buy into the one that's up there, or you can buy into the one that I believe that at Jesus' death, he went to paradise, he conquered what he needed to do there, he preached to those people, and then he led captivity captive and took paradise to heaven. I believe that Paul said to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord, and I believe what Paul said, for he'd been called into a place called the third heaven, and there he saw things that he could not even tell about, and I believe that that third heaven was the heaven God Almighty and Jesus Christ is today. Now, I don't have time to go into a great big long explanation sermon about why I buy into what I'm telling you about, but that's coming down the line. But as of right now, I want you to see where we're talking about when we're talking about a place called Paradise, the Great Gulf, and a place called Tartar. This is called the Hadean Ram. And the one who had power over it, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 2 and 14, happened to be the devil. Of 
for inasmuch as children are partakers of flesh and blood, the likewise also took part in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power over death, that is, the devil. So the devil had power over this, and one of the reasons that Christ came to die was to destroy the devil's power. Now there are many religions out there today that try to refute a lot of what the story of the rich man and Lazarus said. And I'd like to refute their refuting and show you today about why this story is important. They refute many false doctrines. One of them that is refuted is called modernism. It says here that modernism, that they deny miracles, that they also deny the inspiration of the Bible. Now you and I must both know that that's not true. That miracles did happen with Jesus. It did happen with the apostles, for they were given power upon high to do what they did. And that the inspired word of God is God breathed, and it is given to us and what I have on my podium right here, and that is the holy word of God. In fact, Jesus himself, he basically endorsed Moses, and it tells us in Luke 16 and verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And then also in 16 and 31, he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So he endorsed the teaching of Moses and the prophets. Jesus also believed in the story of the flood and creation, for it tells us in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, that as the days of Noe were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Also in Matthew uh, 19 and verse 4 through 6, and he actually said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man, let not man put asunder. And then we also have a refuting of the doctrine of the Christian sign. It is also refuted because they came to they claim to believe in Christ, but they basically also they deny the sin and the sores and the death and even future punishment. But we know that the Bible tells us that the rich man did die, and that he did die, and he was being in torment, and that he pleaded for mercy. And he says in the scriptures that he was tormented in these flames. He was in great pain. But it tells us here that the rich man, that he was punished after death for what he had done in his life while on earth. And then we have Lazarus. The Bible tells us in 1620, Jesus tells us Lazarus had pain and he had sores. What else was he besides having sores? He was also hungry. And all he wanted was those crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And then the beggar died. And it would be, he received evil things in life, in the flesh. But now he's going to be receiving the good things with his spirit in paradise. And so it refutes the Christian science uh, doctrine that basically denied that there's any sin, denies that he had sores, denies that there was death, and denies that there's any future punishment for any of them. And then another one I'd like to refute is called spiritualism. It is also refuted, and they claim of the spiritualist is that the dead can get back their word to their loved ones on earth. Now the dead, the dead there can that the dead can come back uh, to earth and to help those that basically aren't doing what they need to do. But I want you to know they also say that those in hell are cared for by the saints in heaven. But I want you to know as we look at this account and this story here that Jesus teaches the complete opposite of this account. 
For Jesus says the rich man could get no word back to his brothers in Luke 16, 28 through 34. What did he have? He had five brothers that he wanted to warn them about their evil ways because he did not want them coming to that place and being in torment like he was. Their only chance was to hear Moses and the prophets, and no one was going to let them go back and talk to anyone else. The rich man could not go back to earth. He was not allowed to go do that. And Lazarus could not minister to the rich man by even bringing him a little bit of tip of, of water on his finger to touch his tongue that was in such torment. And then there's another doctrine that's out there and that the doctrine of soul sleeping is refuted. They say, well, they're unconsciously waiting for the resurrection. I ask you, was the rich man conscious or not conscious? He was very conscious. What else did he know? He knew that he was in pain. He could even remember, he could even remember the good things that he had while he was on the earth. But now his conscience was still with him. And he could even remember his five brothers on earth, and he could also tell knew how they were living. And that they would come to the place where he was if they weren't warned about it. What about Lazarus? Was he unconscious? No, Lazarus was conscious, uh, and he had finally had comfort at last, for he was by the side of Abraham, or he was in Abraham's bosom. What about Abraham? He was conscious, and he could think, and he could talk. You see, the body sleeps in death, but not the soul. For we're also told in Matthew 27, 52 through 53, it says, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. What does it say there? The bodies of the saints which slept arose. And then there's another doctrine, and that's the doctrine of purgatory. There's a group that teaches that there is a place called purgatory and that this is where the wicked can be released and that the prayers of the dead saints are heard. Well, how can this be true when the rich man could not escape from where he was, or could he change his position from Hades and go to paradise? The rich man's prayers were definitely not answered. They were of no avail. They were not going to work because that could not be done. And then there's also refutes the false doctrine of Calvinism. Calvinism are basically this, the direct operation of the Holy Spirit by miracles, and that repentance is a direct gift, and that it is not necessary to keep one out of hell is completely refuted. We know that God refused to work a miracle, and look what he did. He sent back, uh, he sent back uh, Lazarus back to convert <coughs> the rich man's five brothers. No, he refused to allow Lazarus to go back to earth so that he could talk to these five brothers. And then Jesus taught that repentance was brought about through the power of God's word, and that's how it's done. For Luke 16, 31 says, and he said to them, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And then in Romans 1 and 16, it says, for the power of God that we talk about, the gospel of Christ, the gospel that's good to everybody. For it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In James 1 and 21, it says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And then there is another doctrine you may not be aware of, and this doctrine is the doctrine of second chances. Doctrine of second chances is completely refuted. The doctrine of second chances, the rich man was not offered a second chance to save himself. He was not offered there. The rich man, he got no, he wanted relief, but he got no relief because he failed. And the judgment will be the way it is when we are at death. 
You've got to be sowing the best that you can possibly sow in this life because when your eyelids close and your heart no longer beats and your soul is from your body, that is it. What you've accumulated in your body is all that you have to present before the Lord for how that you actually did and conducted your life. For it is appointed and the man wants to die and then the judgment. In Hebrews 9 and 27, that's exactly what it says. Also, it says in Corinthians 5 and 2, 2 Corinthians, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And then there is another doctrine, and that's the doctrine that the dead have lost their identity. Well, let me ask you. The rich man had not lost his identity. Lazarus had not lost his identity. Abraham had not lost his identity. None of them had lost their identity. Therefore, the doctrine that I'm talking about, it refutes that one also. Then there's another doctrine that we can live in wealth and ease is refuted. What happened to the faith of the rich man? It was a warning to you and I. Don't be like him. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In Matthew 16 and 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? As we think about this story, we think about exactly what happened between these individual characters that we're talking about. I want us to think about the account of the rich man and Lazarus and what it teaches us. It has taught us that we have to use and be resourceful for the proper use of our, of our riches upon this earth. It also tells us that our destiny is sealed at death. What you're going to get at death is what you've stored up in your body and what you have done. We do not get ease to escape the death that we're going to be sent to. And after death, we will be able to remember about life on earth, as apparently they were able to do also. The Word of God is the only way that we can learn how it is that we need to be saved. And any direct way the account refutes the doctrine taught by some religious people today when they talk about this story. I ask you this morning, are you a Christian? Have you got yourself set up so that the guayo is not going to be played for you when you die? Are you ready to meet your maker? Not a one of us in here know that when we leave here that we will even get to be, be able to come back here tonight. We may not be here anymore. Do you have your heart right with God? Are you prepared to meet God because of your death? I want you to know that we have the formula that's been given to us by Almighty God and Jesus Christ as to what we have to do in order to be ready, in order to have what we need to have, in order to be successful in our life and to receive that crown of life. It tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It tells us, therefore, I've said to you that you'll die in your sins, for you do not believe that I am He. You will die in your sins. We have to repent. I tell you that unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And then we have to confess, for it tells us that whosoever confess him before men, he will confess before his Father who is in heaven. That means me, that means you, that means anyone you know that has confessed him. He will confess them before Almighty God. And then it tells us that we need to believe and be baptized. I want you to notice it does not say in this verse, he who believes and is not baptized will be saved. You cannot find that in that verse. The reason the last part says he that believes not will be condemned, because if you can't even get to the point of believing, there is no way that you can be helped. But if you can believe, then you have to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. And once you've done that,
wants us so bad in heaven. He wants us to be with him. There is nothing that he desires more for his only son here to give his life for us and to be conceived.